Support for Ben Franklin's World comes from the Omohundro Institute of Early American History and Culture. Since 1945, the Omohundro Institute has offered postdoctoral fellowships. Part of the OI's core mission is to support scholars who are turning their dissertation research into significant published scholarship, scholarship that will help frame and expand our knowledge of early American history. Ryan Kishani Poor, an assistant professor of history at Northern Arizona University and a recent OI postdoctoral fellow, tells us about his fellowship experience and why he thinks it was important. At the Yamahundo Institute, I was the 2014 to 2016 postdoctoral fellow. This is a very old fellowship that goes back decades. In particular, my work really looks at 17th and 18th century Mexico. So actually, I work in the Spanish Atlantic and fall into what folks at the Yamahundo Institute have started to call the vast early Americas. At the Almohundro Institute, the focus has long been trying to figure out what life on the ground looked like at a real granular level. And in the case of my own work with disease in the body, that the way that individuals saw their own bodies, their own sicknesses, look to others around them to sort of find their own pathways. And in that sense, to either reinforce existing social relationships or at times challenge them. At the Omohundo Institute, I think the goal of bringing fellows in residence into the Institute is really to build a community of scholars that work across generations, where you have senior scholars in communication and at times collaboration with junior scholars such as myself. There are our graduate students as well at the College of William and Mary who are very much a part of the Institute. I think one of the objectives is to bring the different generations of scholars into close connection. So one has a sense of where the field was, where it is, and maybe where it's headed. Now, I think that's really important for society if we think about the importance of early American history and the history of the Americas writ large. To have really an institution, to have a place where there's tremendous consistency where there's tremendous rigor, where we don't get lost in just questions of the moment, but have a broader, longer institutionalized view of not just the past, but what kinds of questions are important to ask over time. Welcome to Ben Franklin's World, a podcast about early American history with Liz Covart. The study of history is key to understanding who we are and how we can affect a better future. Ben Franklin's world will introduce you to historical people and events that have impacted and shaped our present day world. And now, here's your host, Liz Kovar. Hello, and welcome to episode 101 of Ben Franklin's World, the podcast dedicated to helping you learn more about how the people and events of our early American past have shaped the present day world we live in. Throughout the Doing History series, we've explored how historians find research topics, how they write about the past, and how they organize their research. Today, we continue our investigation of how historians work by exploring how they write about the people, places, and events they found information about in the different historical sources they use. Our guide for this investigation into how historians write is John Demos, the Samuel Knight Professor of History Emeritus at Yale University. John is an accomplished historian and writer. Many historians and readers alike regard him as one of the best writers of history and he's won the awards to back up that impression. During our conversation, John reveals what the new social and new narrative schools of history are and what it's like to write about history in those genres, how John decides whether he should write a book about his research topics, and how John approaches writing and has developed his writing skills over time. But first, you may hear a few imperfections in this recording. John made time to speak to us while entertaining family in the mountains this summer. And unfortunately, our phone connection was not as strong as I would have liked. Sometimes weak phone connections just happen, as you've no doubt heard in previous episodes. Despite these imperfections, which aren't really too numerous, this is a great conversation, and our audio engineer Daryl Darnell and I have done our best to mitigate the occasional drops and pops you may hear on John's line. We're so lucky John made time for us, because he's a fantastic historian and writer, and we're going to learn so much from him. Okay, are you ready to meet John and discover more about how historians write history? Let's get started. With tidings and wisdom to share about our early American past, here is this week's special guest. Our guest is the Samuel Knight Professor of History Emeritus at Yale University. 
He's a social historian who focuses on early America, and he's the author of six books. He won the Bancroft Award for his first book, Entertaining Satan, Witchcraft and the Culture of Early New England, and he won the Francis Parkman and Ray Allen Billington Prizes for his third book, The Unredeemed Captive, a family story from early America, which was also a finalist for the National Book Award. His deep knowledge of how to write history and how to write it well is why he joins us for our Doing History, How Historians Work series to discuss how historians write history. Welcome to Ben Franklin's world, John Demos. I'm glad to be here. Thank you for inviting me. In the preface of The Unredeemed Captive, John notes that as a child, he was drawn to history by the stories. Yet, when he went to college and graduate school, he focused on how to write the new social history because narrative history was in a period of deep eclipse. John, you're a historian known for your narrative style of writing, and it seems hard to believe that you didn't practice this style of writing until well after graduate school. Would you tell us more about your story and about what new social history is and how it differs from narrative history? Well, you know, the first thing I'd like to say is that I wanted to be a writer from, I guess, childhood and long before I thought of being a historian. I wanted to be some kind of writer, and I think up until well into college, I thought I'd probably be a writer of fiction. I could write novels. That would be wonderful. But the fact, as I discovered it fairly quickly, was that I wasn't good at writing fiction. So in some ways, I went to writing history as a kind of fallback. I still wish I could write fiction, still dabble with fiction occasionally, but just sort of for my own benefit. But that's important because it really goes to the matter of stories. Again, when I was a very young person, I was drawn to all kinds of stories, fictional stories and history stories as well. But then when I started graduate school in the mid-1960s, I found that much of what I had expected to be and do as a historian was out of fashion. A new wave was building, what we called at the time the new social history. That sounds an odd way of describing it now because it's, it's so very old, this new social history. But at the time, it did seem very new and fresh, and it was quite different from the storytelling mode that initially drawn me to the idea of history. I guess you asked how to define the new social history. Looking back, I think there are several quick things we might say about it. The one thing, it was about ordinary people and everyday life, not, you know, great public figures, as had mainly been the pattern before then. It was inclusive. Everybody gets a chance to be part of this. Women as well as men, people at lower on the social scale, as well as those at the top. It was frankly interdisciplinary, involved a lot of borrowing, in effect, from other academic disciplines, especially social science. Sometimes the new social history was actually referred to as social science history. That was very important to me. I spent quite a bit of time in graduate school taking courses and seminars, not in the history department, but rather in different social science disciplines. It was about analysis and interpretation as opposed to mere description. I say mere description in a sort of slightly sneering way that we would have said at the time. And finally, it aimed for depth as opposed to breadth. It really was a strong wish to kind of get to the bottom of things. Now, all of these characteristics, looking back, I think represented a major reorientation of the whole discipline. Before that point, and I again, I'm talking about the 60s and maybe on into the 70s, before that point, I think the predominant style in historical study and writing was narrative, what I would now call kind of old narrative and descriptive and different in all the ways I've just tried to articulate. That's kind of a, a mouthful, but uh, that's the basic difference. Now, if we move forward in time and come to the revival of narrative history in the last, what, 20 or 25 years, what some call the new narrative history, yeah, that's very different from the old narrative history, I think. Would you tell us about this new narrative history and how it differs from the old narrative history? In a very simple sense, it does involve storytelling, you know, stories that have beginnings, middles, and ends, so sequencing in that sense is important. But it's come to mean, I think, a lot more than old-style narrative. I'm currently co-editing with my friend and former student Aaron Sachs at Cornell University. We're co-editing a volume which we're actually calling Artful History, which is another way of perhaps referring to the new narrative history. And there, I think, we try to emphasize a lot that goes well beyond traditional ideas about storytelling. For one thing, we emphasize a kind of literary side of historical writing. I'm very interested and have long been interested now in the connections between history and fiction. As I already mentioned, that's kind of where I started out so long ago. I think it's wrong to think of fiction and nonfiction as a kind of rigid boundary. I think there's instead, I like to think of it more as a kind of borderland with lots of overlap. 
And this means that I think artful historians have to use techniques and modes of writing that we more commonly associate with fiction writing, questions of plotting and tone and pitch and things of that sort. I would say that as artful historians, we aim to evoke as well as to describe and argue. We want to reach for people's feelings, both our own as authors and those of the readers as well. And finally, I guess I would say in that connection that we try to tap into themes and questions, at least indirectly, themes and questions that go beyond any particular historical time and place, things that are sort of fundamentally existential that have to do with being human, the kinds of things that, of course, novelists and poets and so on and philosophers deal with, but uh, historians have basically, I think, sort of dealt themselves out of that conversation, at least until recent times, and it seems to me we ought to be part of the conversation. I would just say one more, I hope, clarifying thing on that score. I've, I've come to think of history as historical study as, in, as having three sort of levels or dimensions. The first is the particular, all the details of a given time and place and specific situation. Then there's the general, which is where we try to grasp some larger conclusions about the particulars that we're bringing forward. And finally, there's what I call the generic. These are themes and questions that really go beyond any given historical time and place and have to do with all our lives as humans. I think I sort of was raised to believe that historians are mainly or even only concerned with the particular and the general. But I've slowly come to think that we too should get into the act, so to speak, around generic issues and questions. I'd like for us to talk a bit about your writing philosophy and practice. But before we do, I think we need to know one more part of your story. Also in The Unredeemed Captive, you mentioned that you came back to the narrative style of history almost as if by accident. Would you tell us how and when you decided to return to the narrative style of writing? Sure. There's really a very specific turning point there. This has to do with the book I wrote in the 70s and early 80s called Entertaining Satan. It's a study of, the subtitle is Witchcraft in the Culture of Early New England. It's all about witchcraft in 17th century New England. It's highly focused and so on. A large part of it is in the mode of the new social history. It's full of cross-disciplinary borrowing, psychology, sociology, and so forth and so on. And I actually wrote a lot of that book, as I just said, in the new social history mode with lots of general conclusions about what underlay belief in witchcraft and behavior based on that kind of belief. And when I finished those parts of the manuscript, I felt there's something missing here, and namely people. I really had included very few references to individual people. It was all about structural questions and so forth and so on. So I thought that to kind of make up for that what seemed to be a deficiency, I would write a series of, as I thought of them, of case studies about particular witchcraft cases where people would be front and center. And this would kind of make a nice complement to the kind of general discussion that I had already created for the other parts of the book. So I wrote these so-called case studies. Well, actually, they were narratives, as I now look back, of particular witchcraft cases. And I found as I wrote them that I enjoyed writing them a great deal, really more than I had enjoyed the kind of social science-based discussion that I had written in the other parts of the book. So I thought maybe this is what I really would like to do best in the future. And this was the mid-1980s as I was finishing that book. And it was at that point that I really decided to sort of change my spots as a history guy and no longer to do the new social history with all it involved, but to move in a new direction, which I think can be at least very loosely characterized as narrative history. So I began to write the book that eventually became The Unredeemed Captive, which is really a very different kind of book from Entertaining Satan or anything else that I'd written before. I'd like to dive into your writing process. And let's begin with how you decide whether a topic warrants a book. Because in the preface to The Heathen School, a story of hope and betrayal in the age of the early republic, you state that, quote, a book project is a major commitment, end quote. And then you wonder if your newfound subject, the Cornwall, Connecticut Heathen School, had cleared that bar. So, John, would you give us an overview of the history you tell in The Heathen School and how you decided that this story warranted a book? I'll try to give you a very short thumbnail of the story that's at the heart of the heathen school. This young guy who turns out to be a Hawaiian turns up one day in the year, I think it's 1809, on the steps of Yale College. He's a very conspicuous figure from all the Yale undergraduates. It turns out that he is a Hawaiian and he's been sort of let off a ship in New Haven, found his way to Yale, and he's weeping as the other students observe him there on the steps of the college and they ask him why he's 
he's in such distress. And he says, and I think these are the words that have come down to us in the story of his life. He says, because nobody gives me learning. In short, he would like to have what the Yale students are having at the same point in their lives. And that leads to the students kind of taking him under their wing and beginning to teach him, to train him in English language and in other kind of academic subjects, and perhaps most important of all, from their point of view, in Christian faith and practice. He becomes converted. He becomes actually quite well educated after a few years of this. And his progress, as it were, leads a number of important figures at Yale and all around New England, mainly Protestant ministers led by the then Yale president, Timothy Dwight. It leads them to conceive of a grand scheme to found a special school where the same sort of thing has already happened to Obukiah will happen on a much broader scale to other young men, heathen, as they said, heathen young men brought from all parts of the world who will in their turn become educated, civilized, quote unquote, and converted, above all, converted to Christianity. And then they'll go back to their own homelands and start similar projects where they live among their own people. And the school gets going and there's a lot of excitement about it. The leaders and founders of the school announce all this as a plan to save the world in their terms. And they even calculate that in a certain number of years, I think they often thought it might be about 60 years, the whole world would be saved by this process that they were initiating. From this tiny acorn, so to speak, a mighty oak will grow. So they bring in students from all parts of the world, including increasingly Native Americans, American Indians. And there is this kind of, as we now look back on it, a kind of bubbling multicultural activity going on. The school lasts only about 10 years, and then something happens that wasn't part of the plan at all. Namely, romance develops between some of the heathen youth, the students at the school, and local townswomen. And this was all happening in the little town of Cornwall, Connecticut. This creates a kind of scandal, interracial and interethnic connection was and certainly marriage and courtship and marriage was nothing that the founders planned or that the American public at the time would tolerate. And at first, officials of the school deny that any such thing is actually happening. But it turns out that two very serious courtships are underway, both involving Native American young men, students at the school, and local women. And these courtships, in fact, lead to marriage in both cases. These are young Cherokee men who marry their Connecticut sweethearts and take them back to North Georgia, the Cherokee Nation. And the result, to cut a long story a bit shorter, is a huge scandal with really national dimensions discussed all over the country. And it leads to the closing of the school. And then there's a kind of tag end of the story, which was that these two young Cherokee men, John Ridge and Elias Boutineau, go back to become leaders of the Cherokee Nation. They come right from the pinnacle of Cherokee society and life, and now they're very well educated. So they become leaders of the nation, and leaders also in the process of trying to resist the removal of the Cherokees. This, this is where the kind of little story, so to speak, of the heathen school meets the big story of American national growth and development because, as everyone knows, there's a process underway in the 1820s and 30s to remove Indians from their traditional territories, and especially in the southeastern part of the country, to the west, to Oklahoma. Anyway, Ridge and Boudinot resist that process as much as they can as negotiators, as leaders leaders of the nation, until finally they decide it's not, can't work, and they sort of flip. They decide that the only recourse really is to accept the terms that the Jackson administration is offering around removal and to accept removal, and they in turn lead the removal process to Oklahoma, where they pay for their efforts by losing their lives. They're both assassinated by tribal opponents. Most Cherokees at the time, I'm tempted to say almost to the present day, regard Ridge and Boudinot as fierce to the nation, and so they eventually are murdered on a single morning. The story has a kind of really downside ending. So that's the story. Now let me just say very briefly why it cleared the bar for me. And that is because I thought it was about some larger issues in American culture and history that are of lasting importance again, right to the present day. For one thing, the whole heathen school plan was a very vivid example of what we have come to call American exceptionalism, the idea that America has a mission to save the world. And I actually think that idea has been present from long before the foreign mission school was founded, the heathen school, as it was informally called, and it has remained a central issue in the rhetoric of uh, the election campaign in 2016, in fact. So I thought this was a really sharp instance of that particular powerful 
theme in American history. It was also about the issue, as we now refer to it, of diversity, of crossing ethnic and racial lines in various ways, including romantic and marital ways. So there, too, it tapped into a powerful theme in American history, American culture. And finally, it struck me that it's important that sometimes we consider failure as historians. This is clearly a story of failure. This was an idea that was really, I think, very misconceived from the start, and it flamed out at a certain point in a way that was very painful. So I say all this up front in the uh, prologue of the book, Exceptionalism, Diversity, and Failure. And now those are three big deals in my mind. And when I could see that this story kind of, of all of those three, I was ready to go to the gun. In general, is that how you decide that you have a book? You have a good local story that you find very interesting and compelling, and that also ties in with the larger issues of national history. In your mind, if your story meets those criteria, it warrants a book? I think so. I mean, I think that's kind of the way I decide. It has to have more meaning and significance than is just apparent right on the surface of the particular details, whatever they are. I reached the same point with The Unredeemed Captain. That book, too, is about crossing cultural boundaries, which is a theme that has always preoccupied me. What's your writing process like? Say like The Heathen School, you found a topic that you've decided to write a book about. What do you do next? How do you actually write a book? Well, I'm the kind of historian who does a lot of research before he puts a single word on the page. In the case of the Heathen School, I think I did all my research before I started doing any writing. You know, there's always the question of when you stop doing research, you can always do more, I would imagine, with almost any topic and hope to find more. But I get to a point when I think whatever it is I'm learning that they didn't know before the team's new actually doesn't change my understanding of the story at all. So what I'm learning now, as opposed to what I learned when I was at a much earlier earlier stage in research. What I'm learning now just doesn't really change things very much, so maybe it's time to stop, even though I know that there probably are more valuable bits of information out there. So at that point, that is a turning point for me. I think, all right, I've got to uh, tackle the writing now. I don't work in any very detailed way with outlines, but I will probably try to prepare a general sense of what the, I don't know, the chapters might be, although I would say that's very much subject to change as I go along, and it does change. Maybe this is the point at which which one might try to write a book proposal in order to get a contract or something like that. So publishers would certainly want to have some kind of outline and that inducement as well. And I pretty much write, once I have a sense of the broad sequence of things, I pretty much write from you know front to back, from the early part of the story to the latter parts. Occasionally, when I think I have a special kind of issue that I'm struggling with, I may plunge in and try to write a chapter that would be in the middle, but pretty much go sort of A, B, C, D in that order. You mentioned that you do most of the research before you write. Do you have a tried and true method for knowing when to stop researching? Aren't you ever worried that you will miss an important source that might tell you something new? I know when I reach a point where I'm not learning anything new. I've spent, you know, the last three days reading documents X, Y, and Z, and my gosh, they don't really change my view of the whole picture much at all. So I think now it's time to stop. That doesn't sound very sharp and specific and uh, like a tried and true method, but it's an important moment. And it seems to me that every book I've written, I've reached that point. The research is no longer adding anything. So it's time to stop. And if there's a danger, I think, I know that I've seen this. I've seen this in we a few students of mine, doctoral students and others, who just keep thinking, oh my gosh, there must be more to research here. There's stuff I haven't found. And so they go on and on and on. And it involves really just putting off endlessly the process of sitting down and pulling it together and, and writing it up. It's crucial, I think, but it, it doesn't amount really to a tried and true method. When you're writing up your research, how do you decide what information to include in your books and what information to leave out? Well, again, it's very intuitive. I don't think there's any tried and true method. I try to make sure that whatever I include moves the story. Now we are talking mainly about stories in a certain sense. Moves the story along. The danger is that you get drawn off into what's essentially your tangents. And I've made mistakes. I'll say right out front that if I were to redo the heathen school, there's some material, especially in the front of the book, that I would not have included. That material was very sort of hard won. It was difficult to 
get the full details of the early phases of the Eden School and the life of this Hawaiian guy who sort of inspired it. His name was Henry Obukaya. You know, I went to Hawaii. I was very pleased with the scraps of information that I found there. And But that was uh, probably a bit of a mistake. I think some readers of my book have found the opening section to be sort of tough going because there's more detail than there needs to be. And I look back on it, I think, and this is a difficulty I've confronted before too, but I think sometimes when you do research that is, as I put it, hard won, you know, you're really pleased that you found this or that nugget and it's your pleasure in the finding which can lead you to include stuff that may not really be important to the story. So you have to be watching yourself, I would say, all the time. Is it just uh, some sort of particular angle on this or that bit of research that's pulling me in, in this direction or is it really the needs and the development of the whole story? It's really tricky ground. The question is hugely important and not really easy to answer in any very precise way. Many listeners submitted questions for you. Lindsay wonders how you weave the analysis that historians value. Those parts of books and articles where historians tell you all about the historical sources they're using and how they're interpreting those sources. She wonders how you weave that analysis into a narrative that's fun and compelling for readers. Well, weave is the right word, the right image, I think, because it is a matter of sort of combining the narrative as such with some kind of interpretive depth. Another word that I sometimes use in trying to talk about this is embed. I think the analysis, the interpretation can be and needs to be embedded in the narrative. And that's a tricky process. And some people are really good at it and some are less so. One way of dealing with that problem, it's almost like it's a bit of a dodge, but it still is a reasonable possibility is to separate the narrative and the interpretive side. That is to say, to do a chapter that is the story, the heart of the story, and then do another chapter where you basically reflect on the narrative and its meaning and interpretation. And to some extent, I did that in the Heathen School. There are long chapters, which are, I would say, strictly narrative, that are surrounded by kind of contextual chapters where I try to set the stage for the uh, different parts of the narrative and in a way to provide some interpretive context and depth. Another way to address that problem, I think, is to state your interpretive concerns and objectives out front at the beginning and then let the narrative sort of flow from there. But again, this is a very big question. One doesn't want to write a narrative that seems to be just all on the surface. You want to tap some deeper level. And finally, and going back to something I said before, to speak to your reader at a level that he or she can not just understand, but really feel in his or her gut. What I would call artful historical writing involves feelings as much as cognition, what's going on in your heart as well as your head. And I mean that both for the author and for the reader. The appeal should be to both sides. You mentioned that you like to state your interpretive objectives up front. And this ties in with Joe's question. He'd like to know how you came by your writer's voice. And specifically, he's curious about how you made the decision to use kind of self-conscious asides to open a window onto your research. For example, in Chapter 2 of The Heathen School, John begins with the lines, quote, Who was Henry Obokaya? Should we believe the legend as historical fact? Perhaps not, because when we set the legend in the context of the entire Obokaya legend, it seems almost too good to be true. Still, it can be taken as a kind of capsule of much that did happen in this place, with these people, at around this time, end quote. Would you tell us how you decided to state your objective that way and how these asides have developed as part of your writing style? Well, those asides are something that sort of began to happen in my writing as I turned to the narrative mode. I don't think I remember them starting to happen, so to speak, not really with any planning on my part in the course of writing The Unredeemed Captive, where they're sprinkled all through that book, I think, and again in The Heathen School. I see them now as attempts to connect more directly with my reader, to involve my reader in the process of thinking through a certain question or issue that is raised by the story. And they do kind of stick out. Sometimes that worries me a bit, and maybe they kind of break the flow. But nonetheless, it is important to me. It's, you know, it's 
actually always been important to me, even in the new social history mode, to find ways to connect with wherever the reader is at. And as to sort of finding one's voice, writing voice, well, any writer of almost any sort will tell you the most important thing is to read, 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 read a lot. And in my case, it's been very important to read not just history, but also fiction. Some crucial moments in my development as or life as a writer have come from reading works of fiction, in some cases historical fiction, but other kinds of fiction as well. I will just mention one that seems to be especially important as I look back. In the 1970s, when I was full into my new social history mode, I read Wallace Stegner's novel, Angle of Repose. I think it came out in the early 70s. I don't think I read it when it came out. But at that point, I was a practitioner of what was called family history. My focus was the study of family life in early America. And when I read this novel, which is a historical novel, essentially about a particular family in the mid to late 19th century and early 20th century, I thought, oh my gosh, what Stagner has achieved here is a kind of depth of portrayal of family life in the American past that we scholars, we historians, have just never achieved. So that and other novels, I mean, reading novels just ever since has been an important part of my life. I kind of try to set aside time in the evenings or whenever to read novels because I think that's a kind of writing that can be very useful. It sort of has to be sort of transposed into a historical framework, you might say. But for me, that was crucial and remains crucial to finding some sort of good writing voice. Christopher would like to know how you think while you write. Specifically, he'd like to know how you balance your desire to write a compelling narrative history with the historian's professional need to responsibly contextualize the experiences of peoples from other times, places, and cultures for your readers. Yeah, that question sort of raises the whole issue of the balancing act that all of us as historians have to perform between doing justice to the past and the differentness of the past, the integrity of the past, uh, with our own position as human beings and writers and historians alive in the 21st century. And it is a balancing act, I think. I certainly want to convey this element of differentness in historical situations I write about. But at the same time, I think my concerns and underlying questions and to some extent the tone of my experience of doing historical research comes from my present life and is infused in some ways by my present life. Perhaps I will mention in this connection one story that I sometimes tell about the unredeemed captive story of a Puritan girl captured by Indians and taken off to Canada where she spent the rest of her long life. I knew I was very sort of personally engaged with and drawn to this story from an early point, but I didn't really understand the nature of my connection to it until one night, just after the book was published, when I sat in my living room reading a New Yorker article. By the way, the New Yorker is, I think, a great thing for historians and all sorts of people to read in order to become better writers. Anyway, I was reading this article. This was about I think, the mid-1990s. The article was about a terrible kidnapping that had occurred in California, I think, a few years before. A young girl was taken out of her house by the kidnapper and eventually found murdered. And there was a line in the story of this girl that really made a huge impact on me. And the line was roughly kidnapping as a special meaning for parents because it achieves in a single moment what otherwise is the work of years and years, the realization that our children have a life that is separate from our own. That's almost verbatim. It's practically inscribed in my heart. Realization that our children have a faith that is different from our own. Well, when I read that line, I remember it well, I knew that I had stumbled on the core of the story I had written about the underdeemed captive. And I also was able to make the connection to my own personal situation because my two daughters were just at that point going off to college and entering a world of their own. It was not of my making anymore, a process that affected me very deeply. So it was very important, actually, that that project sort of came to me at the crucial time in my own life. And I think my own personal and family experience infused the book with whatever sort of energy, emotional energy, one might say, that it had. Again, a very long and roundabout answer. You've acknowledged that the present day often plays an important role in the stories that you're writing and telling. 
do you have any tips or tricks for balancing how your personal life in present day plays into the stories you're telling? In other words, how do you try and maintain your objectivity while you're writing about history? There's a very important process that you have to be aware of and sort of impose on yourself. And that is a process of constant self-examination. It's one thing to say that your own concerns as an author and historian, your own concerns are present in the work you're doing. It's another thing to find that those concerns are sort of distorting the record of the past. And so, I don't know, I try always to be aware and literally to take a certain little bit of time every now and then to think about my own connection to the story I'm trying to tell and to strike the balance between sort of using my experience to infuse and maybe even shape the story on the one hand and avoiding the temptation and the difficulty that I might be, I might really be misrepresenting the people that I'm writing about. Again, it's a very delicate balance, but I think you can deal with it. Hopefully you can deal with it by a lot of self-awareness. Anyway, I think that's the best answer I can give. During our conversation, you've mentioned that we should read widely, that we should indulge in novels and New Yorker essays, not just in history books, and that we should know and confront our biases. Do you have any other tips or tricks for those of us who would like to start writing about history or for those of us who already write about history and would like to improve our techniques to write better? I don't think there are tips or tricks. I can only repeat what I said about the importance of reading and reading widely. Reading is itself a very important kind of experience. It goes on, of course, in one's head as opposed to out in the wider world. But you need a lot of that in order to be able finally to create something useful yourself. Let's move into the time warp. Normally, this is the fun segment of the show where we ask you a hypothetical history question about what might have happened if something had occurred differently or if someone had acted differently. However, in keeping with our doing history theme of time machine use, we're going to let you use our time machine to travel into the future. The time warp. Historians can't predict the future, but they can speculate about what might have been. So, John, in your opinion, how will the historians of the future research and write about our present day, given the huge volume of emails, tweets and other Internet communications that we engage in? How will historians use this type of digital evidence to write the historical narratives of the future? Well, all I can say is that if I imagine myself as this historian in and of the future, I probably would try to operate in as close as possible a way as I already do. That's what I know how to do. So if I find myself uh, facing a huge file of emails or tweets or whatever it might be, I would print them out uh, where I could really read and think about them in just about the same way that I've always thought about historical documents. I would try to close the distance, as it were, the apparent distance between the way material comes to us now and also in the future. And there's one other thing I might say, and I sort of meant to say earlier in this connection, I think there's been a gradual movement over a good many years among historians to include non-verbal, non-literary, as it were, forms of evidence, word evidence, and to also include material evidence, objects, things, landscapes, whatever. And I expect that trend will continue. I mean, the documentary record includes both words and things. And certainly as a young historian coming into the field, I was trained almost exclusively to focus on words. But over the years, I've come to appreciate material kinds of evidence just about as much. And in that sense, I think the evidentiary base itself may expand. And maybe there are things we can't even imagine. There's words, things, and some kind of X factor that will come into the picture. I hope we can be alert to that opportunity as it presents itself. Earlier, you mentioned that you and Aaron Sachs are working on a volume about narrative history. Would you tell us about that volume and what else you're working on? The volume is a collection of uh, other people's essays. Oh, well, I guess there's one or two by myself and Aaron, but mostly it's other people's essays that we think are exemplary, so to speak, for the whole activity of artful history, invoke the title that we're planning for the volume. We hope to, in short, you know, present the cream of the crop under this rubric of artful history of the last 20 or so years. And as for myself, I'll just mention two things. I have just finished writing a children's book version, or maybe it's a young adult version of the under 
redeemed captive. That has been suggested to me for many years that this might be a useful, worthwhile thing to do. And I finally went ahead and did it, and I had a lot of fun doing it, partly because a large part of it is actually fictionalized. It's the unredeemed captive for younger readers and in sort of as historical fiction. So that's one thing. And if I have one more book in me, it will be something very different, at least in content, from anything I've done before. It will be about the amazing story of the biggest silver mine and sort of silver boomtown in the world, the city of Potosi in Bolivia, South America, where I traveled many years ago and began to learn about Potosi. I knew very little about it before I went there, but this is one of the really big stories, I think, in world history. Silver from Potosi went all over the world. It kind of fueled the coming of the rise of capitalism, one might say. It affected the monetary structure of Europe and other parts of the world, and it's a fascinating sort of conglomeration of smaller stories within the bigger story. I'm really looking forward to the challenge of entering a different historical field. I've never written about Latin America before. I'm struggling now to bring my reading knowledge of Spanish back up to speed, but I'm excited. Also, I have to say a little daunted whether I can really pull this off or remains to be seen. So that's where my agenda stands these days. Wow, that sounds really exciting. Good luck with your new project. Is there a place where we can go to find out more information about you, perhaps follow along with your new Bolivian adventures, and learn about how we can contact you if we still have questions about how to write history? Well, first of all, about the Potosi idea, I did write a small essay about Potosi for the online journal Commonplace. So if anybody wanted to kind of see the gist of that story, or at least my take on it, you could find it on Commonplace. As for other kinds of information about me, I'm really not sure what to say. That's okay, John. There are actually a couple of articles about you posted online by institutions where you've had fellowships. Plus, Yale University keeps a page with your email address on it and a link to those places in the show notes. John Demos, thank you for taking us through your writing process and for helping us better understand how historians write about history. It's been a pleasure to talk to you. It's nice for me to have a chance to look back over a long career and try and figure out where I've been. Thanks again. Read widely. Stop researching when you stop learning, and remember your readers when you're writing. Our conversation with John was rich and full of great information, but I think it's these three points that are the biggest lessons he shared. For John, writing about history is the same as telling a good story, and we learn to tell and write good stories by reading the work of great storytellers. This is why John encourages us to read widely, not only within the field of history, but outside of it too. Stop researching when you stop learning something new. For many of us, the urge and desire to stay in the archive is real. We love finding information and always worry that we might find something new that will change what we know about our entire project or a large portion of it. One of the reasons John has been so prolific with his writing is because he stops researching when he stops learning and he gets right to his writing. And when he writes, John thinks of his readers. He relies on practice and on his wide reading to take the evidence he's found about his topic and to craft that evidence into a compelling story that his readers want to read. Writing a compelling history means thinking about how we talk about the people, places, and events we study. It means considering the details we include in our stories and the details we need to leave out in order to keep our stories moving. As John acknowledges, this is not an easy process. Writing is hard, time-consuming work. But writing can also be fun and sometimes the most rewarding experience of being a historian. You can find more information about John, his books, The Unredeemed Captive and The Heathen School, plus everything we talked about today on the show notes page, benfranklinsworld.com slash 101. On the show notes page and in your Ben Franklin's World app, you'll also find a link to a PDF I created with advice from about 20 historians. These historians share details about how they write history and their contact information so that you can get in touch with them if you have questions about their writing practices. The Alejandro Institute of Early American History and Culture has long believed that the history of early America matters, and it promotes the study and knowledge of early America through its publications, conferences, and fellowships. Ryan Kashani Poor told us about one of its many great programs, the OI Postdoctoral Fellowship. It's a prestigious fellowship, and it's been around since 1945. It's the fellowship that's helped many historians think through and publish early works that you've enjoyed reading and hearing about on this podcast. 
Previous OI postdoctoral fellows include Gordon Wood, Alan Taylor, Brett Rushforth, Greg O'Malley, and Mark Hanna. To discover more about the Omahundro Institute and its important work, visit benfranklinsworld.com slash OI. And if you're a recent PhD graduate and you think you have an important project that will help shape and inform what we know about early America, check out the OI's postdoctoral fellowship program. They're accepting applications for their 2017-2019 fellowship until October 31st. You'll find all the information you need to apply on their website. Finally, how do you write about history or what history books and articles do you think are the most compelling reads? Send your answers to Liz at BenFranklinsWorld.com, tweet me at Liz Covart, or post a comment on the show notes page or in our listener community on Facebook. And remember, never leave till tomorrow that which you can do today.